Many of us find our innermost fears or hopes take arms while we sleep, ready to strike at the moment of wakening. Churchill recorded that on the morning of the 26th of July, 1945, he woke up with a sharp stab of almost physical pain to find himself sure that he and the Conservatives had just lost the general election. There was a long delay for the votes to be brought back from battlefields around the world. Few people thought the war leader could lose power. Most Labour leaders assumed he would be returned. So did the apparently well-informed city experts, the in-touch trade union bosses, the self-certain press, the diplomatic observers passing back the latest intelligence to Washington and Moscow. Churchill was at the very peak of his personal triumph, outshining the king and royal family when he appeared on the famous balcony to wave. Never in British history has military success been so personally associated with a civilian leader. Not the two great pits, not Disraeli at his peak, not David Lloyd George could rival Churchill's radio age charisma. True, 1945 had been a most unusual election. The Parliament it ended had begun in the middle of the 30s, nine years, six months and 20 days earlier, making it the longest UK Parliament ever. A Parliament of old men unused to raw party conflict. Churchill would have liked it to go on longer, at least until Japan was defeated. Never quite a party man, he had a coalition cast of mind. It had been Labour which insisted on the election. Now no one knew what was coming. The scattered and disrupted nature of the electorate meant accurate polling was impossible. The new electoral roll was inaccurate too, having been based on ration book records. Among those who found they had no vote because of clerical errors was the Prime Minister himself. For those with ears to hear, there were intimations of what was about to happen. During the war, a high-minded religious socialism had become fashionable at home. As the carnage ground on overseas, an almost utopian determination to build a more Christian country took root. As early as 1940, the great wartime Archbishop of Canterbury, William Temple, had called for extreme inequalities of wealth to be abolished. Going rather further, his Council of Clergy and Ministers for Common Ownership declared private ownership of industry contrary to divine justice. In the forces, compulsory discussions about Britain after the war had been led by the Army Bureau of Current Affairs, ABCA, organised by a left-leaning educationalist called W.E. Williams. Conservative-minded officers complained about the tone of the pamphlet sent round the army and that Williams had smothered the troops in seditious literature. William Harrington and Peter Young state that one general burned 10,000 of the wretched pamphlets in front of his men and warned that they were rank treason. To this day, many Conservatives believe that socialist propaganda foisted on the troops was to blame for their defeat in 1945. In fact, the numbers do not add up. The minimum voting age was 21, which cut out many of the more malleable troops, and in any case there were fewer than 2 million service votes cast in a total electorate of 33 million. The change was happening among civilians. A strong sense that it was time for a fresh beginning had been reflected in a series of by-election defeats of Tory candidates when vacancies were caused in the Commons by the deaths of sitting members. 22 MPs were killed fighting, all but one of them Conservatives. At Malden, in Essex, the left-wing journalist Tom Dryberg had won, standing as an independent. By 1943, candidates for the piously socialist Commonwealth movement, founded by our English traveller J.B. Priestley and by Sir Richard Ackland, were winning upset victories up and down England. In April of that year, the Battle of Britain pilot John Loveseed won a Cheshire seat. Lieutenant Hugh Lawson won Skipton in the Yorkshire Dales. 
most sensationally of all, in April 1945, in Tory Chelmsford, Wing Commander Ernest Millington, a pre-war pacifist and socialist who had then joined the RAF and turned his attention to bombing Germany, defeated the Conservative candidate. Millington, standing for Commonwealth and supported by local vicars, had fought a remarkably aggressive campaign, whose tone can be summarised by a banner he put up in the middle of the market town, which read, This is a fight between Christ and Churchill. By 1945, there was a whiff of Oliver Cromwell in the air. The Labour conference, which kick-started the election campaign one hot afternoon in Blackpool, is still remembered for the youth of the delegates. Dennis Healy was there, in battle dress and beret, fresh from the battlefront in Italy, preaching red-hot socialist revolution. Across Europe, the upper classes were selfish, depraved, dissolute and decadent, he told the cheering hall. Roy Jenkins, who had helped crack the German codes at Bletchley Park, was there too, a slim and dapper soldier. There was even a socialist rear admiral. Labour's manifesto, well written and snappily designed, would be distributed to nearly two million people backed by powerful posters, 12 million leaflets and huge numbers of party volunteers. Its most popular passages could hardly have come as a shock. They relied on the blueprint for a fairer, more planned country, which had been worked out by the coalition government before the war ended. Labour had the support of only a minority of the national press. Apart from the Daily Mirror and its in-house Daily Herald, the big circulation papers were all pro-Tory, and the two upmarket leftish newspapers, the Manchester Guardian and the News Chronicle, both backed the lost cause Liberals. Different parts of the country found very different audiences for Labour's meetings. Attlee was rushing about in his little standard car, wrapping out around eight speeches of a terse twenty minutes apiece every day. He thought his reception was excellent. In some towns the election seemed quiet. In others, huge and attentive crowds turned up to listen and argue back. In Birmingham, Roy Jenkins, quoted by Norman Howard in A New Dawn, recalled seas of faces looking up in the twilight, a mixture of exhaustion, hope, some kind of doubt. A sea of tired faces looking up in hope. That's the best phrase I can make of it. Churchill, meanwhile, was fighting one of the bad campaigns of his life. His theme was that Labour was a sinister socialist conspiracy. In a badly misjudged radio broadcast, kicking off his campaign, he let his florid wartime language loose and struck entirely the wrong note. No socialist system, he said, could be established without some form of political police, a British Gestapo. Instead, he offered a vision of bucolic good cheer, which would have seemed dated in the aftermath of the Boer War. Let us make sure that the cottage home to which the warrior will return is blessed with modest but solid prosperity, well fenced and guarded against misfortune. Attlee answered him with gentle irony. The Gestapo suggestion was grossly offensive, but the Labour leader disarmingly replied that it was no doubt Churchill's way of demonstrating the gulf between his qualities as a great war leader and those of a mere party leader, and that the attack had probably been devised by the press baron Lord Beaverbrook. It was, in fact, all Churchill's own work. His wife, Clemmy, had strongly warned him against it, and his party's chief whip had commented that it is not my idea of how to win an election. A second line of Tory attack was that Attlee was the mere frontman for extremists. The Labour chairman, Harold Lasky, was portrayed by Conservative candidates as hell-bent on revolution. Lasky did use wild language and was on the left of the party, though his father campaigned for Churchill and had recently suggested that a public fund be raised to show Churchill the nation's gratitude. According to Norman Howard, the Prime Minister said a better monument for him would be a public park for the children of London on the south bank of the Thames, where they suffered so grimly from the Hun. This was never followed up. 
Churchill had based himself in Claridge's Hotel in London and used a private train and a cavalcade of cars to make his speeches around the country. Mostly, he won an enthusiastic enough reception, though he was dumbfounded to find himself booed by a large section of the crowd in his final rally at Walthamstow. This was not quite the respectful British nation of myth. Despite these warning signs, the brutal rejection of Churchill for Attlee caused amazement around the world. Before the election result was declared, the two men had been together at Potsdam in Germany, negotiating the future of post-war Europe with Joseph Stalin and President Harry Truman. Where would Poland's borders be? How hard should defeated Germany be squeezed? Whose was Greece? Returning to London for the results, Churchill had not even bothered to say goodbye to the Soviet dictator or Washington's new man. He did not properly pack. He would be back. Attlee was by then somewhat more optimistic. He thought it would be close. About that, at least, he was wrong. In 1935, the Conservatives had won 585 seats. In 1945, they won just 213. Labour won more votes than the Tories for the first time ever, giving them 393 seats and a majority of 146. When Attlee returned to Potsdam alone, without Churchill, Stalin's right-hand man, Molotov, was incredulous. He suspiciously cross-questioned the Labour leader about why he had not known the result in advance. Such democratic sloppiness would not have been tolerated further east. Churchill, brooding at home, found it a terrible personal shock. When Clemmy tried to cheer him up with the thought that it might be a blessing in disguise, he grunted that, just at the moment, it seemed quite effectively disguised. Yet he quickly spirited a silver lining out from the cloud. The years ahead would be a terrible trial to the British people, Churchill believed. Might not Labour be better left to cope with the disappointments to come? At last, discovering the generosity of spirit that had gone absent without leave during his election campaigning, the old man rebuked one of his aides, This is democracy. This is what we have been fighting for. What had Labour been fighting for? The party's new MPs arriving in London by train, car and bus were a mixed bunch. Most were inexperienced in the ways of Parliament as they would soon show by giving a raucous rendition of the red flag in the temporary chamber, the historic one having been demolished by the Luftwaffe. There were Fabian intellectuals, wartime rebels, trade unionists and civil servants such as the podgy, mustachioed Harold Wilson. Soldiers and teachers, cautious moderates and so the Communist Party believed at least nine secret communist plants. All of them had stood on a manifesto written by Herbert Morrison and a young idealist called Michael Young, who would go on to found the Consumers Association. It called for the establishment of the Socialist Commonwealth of Great Britain, free, democratic, efficient, progressive, public-spirited. It contained a long list of ideas, but it was as realistic as, in private, Churchill had been about the difficulties ahead. The problems and pressures of the post-war world threaten our security and progress as surely as, though less dramatically than, the Germans threatened them in 1940. We need the spirit of Dunkirk and of the Blitz sustained over a period of years. In the years ahead, this fighting bulldog tone would quickly grate. Some of the new Labour MPs felt they had been elected to overturn the class basis of the country, others that they simply had a difficult list of domestic reforms to get through. As they introduced themselves to one another for the first time, gossiping and exchanging campaign stories, a sizeable minority also believed they had better get rid of the conventional-sounding Attlee and elect a proper leader while there was time. 
Herbert Morrison, a popular minister who had organised London's defence against the Blitz, had warned Attlee that he would stand against him in a party contest. The plot gathered force in the corridors and urinals of Westminster Central Hall. At the same time, Attlee, Morrison, the burly ex-trade union leader Ernie Bevin and the party secretary met at Transport House, the party headquarters a few hundred yards away. As Morrison nipped out to make a call to another supporter, Bevin leaned across to Attlee and growlingly gave him the best advice of his life. Clem, you go to the palace straight away. Clem did. He took tea with his wife Vi and family at Paddington, hopped into their little car and was driven to Buckingham Palace, where the king, a staunch conservative taken aback by the turn of events, duly handed him control of the British Empire. Morrison and the other Labour plotters left half a mile to the east had underestimated Attlee. Many people had. He would go on to become one of the two genuinely nation-changing prime ministers of modern British history. <laughs>